Uh, this shoe, the 1972 Nike Marathoner, is about as thin as you can get. This was what was present back, this is almost 40 years old. And so this, these shoes were very thin. As a matter of fact, they even had almost like a Vibram five finger shoe coming out of the parent company for Asics. Onitsuka Tiger, for those who don't know, was the parent company for Asics. They changed over to the name of uh, being Asics in 1976, I believe. These thin sole marathon shoes with a toe clap were first made by Onitsuka Tiger in 1951. What's even more interesting is that this guy, Shigeki Tanaka, 19 year old who survived the Hiroshima blast, won the 1951 Boston Marathon in time of 227. Now look at his shoe. He's wearing, how about that? He wore a, a what they call a Tommy shoe made by Onitsuka Tiger, very thin sole racing shoe. This was about the only racing shoe out of Japan during the time. So this was, how many years ago? 60 years ago. Thin sole shoes with a toe clip. So it's really interesting. These are some of my favorite shoes. Actually, my very first marathon I ran in 1974, uh, it was called the Ocean Bay Marathon. I went from, Ocean, from Half Moon Bay to Belmont. I was the first junior, so I actually won a pair of shoes because I was first junior. That was a shoe I won. Great racing flat, great and so. You were to take this Onitsuka Tiger Jayhawk and give it to the, the minimalist crowd. They say, oh, it's a great minimalist shoe. No, this is a racing flat. It's what we call a racing flat. The racing flats have been around since how long? 1972, you could say 1951, they've been around all that time. So, it, do we need to call them illness shoes? Well, it's up to you guys. You can call them illness if you want to, but as far as I'm concerned, they're still racing flags. So, here's some of the racing I did. This is me when I had more muscles in here. Uh, this guy, Jim Howard, these are pictures from my Aggie, uh, my running years. This is a run, my cross, actual cross country race I actually do photography for. This guy, Jim Howard, ran Elk Grove High. He won the Western States 100 mile run in 1977. This guy, John Moreno, ran for San Francisco State. Now, this, these pictures were taken by about 1977. He won the San Francisco Marathon in 1970, uh, 1978. So, you know, the guys I ran with at Davis, I mean, these were the top guys in Northern California. So I wasn't running with Sasha, but I wasn't as fast as those guys. But we were, this is the type of people that I was running with. And, and this, and running at that, that level kind of changes your opinion as to what we should do or not. Because back in these days, back when I was at Davis, we would run barefoot. We would run mile repeats around the baseball field, a third of a mile. And I would, one of the guys take our shoes, oh, let's take our shoes today, and we'll run barefoot. And no big deal. I mean, a lot of the college runners back then ran barefoot because it was a nice break. When you're running 70 to 85 miles a week and doing double workouts and you're racing every week, it's nice to have a break. Sometimes a coach would put us on a swimming pool and just say, no workout, you guys are all tired, go in the swimming pool and swim. So the barefoot running was a great deal. I enjoyed it and all the rest of the guys enjoyed it, but this is the type of running that we did and it kind of influenced how I think about barefoot running and when it should be used and when it shouldn't be used. I'm not going to blame you on the running gait cycle. I, I teach biomechanics to podiatry students and other podiatrists, but basically in running, it's different from walking than running. We always have, there's a time during the gait phase where we have both feet off the ground, and that's called the double float phase. But we, our foot hits the ground and foot strike, so it's hitting ground and foot strike, mid support, and then toe off, and then we propel ourselves to the next step, and this is the running gait cycle. One of the things we start seeing, and again, a lot of these blogs and a lot of the different running clinics now, is they're saying, well, you know, you shouldn't heel strike. It's really bad to heel strike because these heel strikers get the injuries. They have too much shock going through them. You need to run on your midfoot or forefoot. Well, let's, let's look at actually the scientific research on that question. There are 753 runners analyzed in this paper from 1983. Now, this was a recreational race. It was some elites and some, you know, average runners. But out of those, 81% were rear foot strikers, 19% were mid foot strikers, and 0% were four foot strikers. Now this is actually high speed cinematography done in the mid portion of the race. There's only two studies that have been done that published. There's a third one on the way that I know about, but I can't tell you the results of that. I know the results, but it's in that same range. 
What's even more interesting, we, okay, we know that the faster runners are more in their midfoot and forefoot because as you run faster and faster and enter into a sprinting speed, you're going to be more in your forefoot. That's just the natural thing. As you run slower, you're going to be more of a rear foot striker. In this study done in Japan in 2007, they took 283 elite international runners. They analyzed them at the two-thirds way mark of a half marathon and found again 75% rear foot strikers, only 24% rear foot strikers, and only 1% rear foot strikers. So even in the elites, they're rear foot striking. So if someone tells you that the, the elites all run midfoot, you can say, well, that's a bunch of you know what. It's not true. <coughs> the truth is that even the elites are most, the vast majority, rear foot strikers. And the new study that hasn't been published yet that will be published is showing greater than 80% rear foot strikers for average runners. So, when we started looking at the Boston Marathon for 2010 at slow motion, we started looking at how they landed. Midfoot strike. Rear heel strike. Heel strike, midfoot strike. These are the leaders at the 2010 Boston Marathon. Heel strike. These are the leaders. Heel strike. Amazing. That's Rosie Ruiz on a black track. <laughs> <laughs> Very picture. Now, do you guys know who Rosie Ruiz is? Yes. Yeah. Who doesn't know about Rosie Ruiz? I'll tell you the story. She was, I don't know what year was Rose Ruiz. Rose Ruiz was a lady who came across the finish line first in the Boston Marathon. That was about 20 years ago. Yeah. She had started the race, got into a car, drove to near the finish, across the finish line, and was trying to get, and she actually, so when you talk about Rose Ruiz to any runner who's been around, that's the definition of a cheap. She had tried to win the marathon without her. Anyway, so that's really, so this is just, I want to show you, this is even a representation of all runners. I just want to show you that even the elite guys, some of them are rear foot strikers. And this is actually, these videos are taken from uh, guy, uh, this guy's run blogger. So if you guys want to go on this website, he has all these videos on his website. It's a run blogger website, excellent. But this talks, this, this video uh, shows uh, him running, oops, there you go, barefoot, vibrance, here is in a Nike Free, and here is in a traditional thicker sole running shoe, just showing the different strike patterns. Again, what, what the tendency is, is that when you have a thicker heeled shoe, you're going to tend to be more of a heel striker, and as you get more into the barefoot and the vibrant situation, you're going to be more of a midfoot and forefoot striker. It's just the inclination of the heel of the shoe that is like that. Question? Yes. Is it true that you would use less energy in the mid to four foot as a mid to four foot tracker? Good question. We'll get to that. Okay. Later. So, she's leading me right on into my next <coughs> topic. We're going to talk about energy. We're going to talk about mechanics of barefoot versus shot running. And as you know, I'm not trying. What I want to do, I know you can kind of tell that I get a little excited about this stuff. <laughs> but you know, I, I, I see so much misinformation on the internet. I hear it when I come here to the clinic. Now, I want you guys to get a good, the good science here, because this is why when I lecture, I don't ever lecture to lay people. I lecture to podiatrists. In fact, I'm debating one of the world's leading researchers on barefoot running in Long Beach. She's a friend of mine, Irene Davis. Uh, Irene's a great friend of mine. We're, she asked me to debate her, so we get to debate high-level stuff. But this is fun for me, because you guys are really the guys who are going to be taking this home with me. So, the thin sole lightweight running shoes, which I call racing flats, and now they're called minimalist shoes, they've been around for over 30 years, and the popular media has obviously drummed this up, because anything that the media finds is different, they like to say, hey, let's go ahead and, you know, let's drum this up, it sounds neat, let's, let's ask this guy, hey, you know, you're a barefoot runner, how's it help you? But when we started looking at the scientific research literature, what does it actually say as regards to barefoot versus shot running? The biggest thing, it seems to be, is that everyone, no one disagrees with this. When you run barefoot versus shod running, and shod running means with shoes, is that you're going to take shorter strides, the stride frequency will increase. When I say stride frequency, that means how many steps per mile are you taking, or how many steps per minute are you taking. And also the, the thought is that the reason that barefoot runners take a shorter stride and they increase their stride frequency versus a shod runner running the same pace that they're trying to avoid heel impact. Because running barefoot on a hard surface, especially you know, asphalt, cement, a hard dirt, if you run barefoot, you're going to hurt your heels. So they will modify their foot strike pattern to avoid heel contact and try to run more than midfoot and their forefoot. 
Now that's just a kind of a self-preservation mechanism because barefoot running, if you've ever tried running barefoot, is that unless you're running on grass, now on grass I used to be able to run heel contact without a problem, but um, you know, you're trying to run on asphalt or cement barefoot and most people are going to land on the forefoot just to save their heels because heel impact can hurt. And how do they do that? The way they do that is they, what we call, pre-activate calf muscles. Now the gastrocnemius and soleus muscles, those are the two largest calf muscles, those are the big bulge, the one that has the big bulge in the back of the calf, they attach to the Achilles tendon. So the electromyographic studies where they actually can put electrical sensors on the muscle and measure how the, their uh, move, uh, how they're firing is that when you switch from uh, the shod running to the barefoot situation, you fire those calf muscles early, that brings the forefoot down to the ground sooner so you can avoid heel contact and have a more comfortable stride when you're running barefoot. The research also shows that this heel fat pattern here is an x-ray, or this is actually a uh, cross-sectional <coughs> MRI scan of the heel. So here's the bottom of the heel, here's the Achilles tendon, here's the ankle bone, the calvitatus, and the calcaneus. Is that heel fat pad is a nice thickness, and we use that heel fat pad to cushion ourselves. And uh, the actual the heel fat pad deformation is 60.5 60 in barefoot, whereas in running it's like 35%. Running in shoes is 35%. So this is further evidence that probably what happens in shoes, we have enough protection that we feel like we can hit the heel first if we want to, whereas in barefoot running, most people avoid it, especially if you're running on hard surfaces. What, what does it mean, the deformation? Is that oh, I'm sorry, so that the crunching. Uh, Deformation, just uh, uh, compression. Okay, 60% so, compression? Yeah, if you took, so basically wow. 60.5, so that means if you're, you had a 100 millimeter it. Uh, and it, it would go down to 39.5, whereas, um, now these were, the, the thing about this research though, they actually had the barefoot runners run on the heel, see, so it's a little unnatural, but it just kind of shows you that the shoe is offering some protection. The other thing that, and this is, seems to be a constant we see in the research, six studies have, that have studied barefoot running, shows that the impact loading rate is actually increased <coughs> in barefoot running. And here we look at, here's the two curves, and this is again, uh, this is ground reaction force, and that's the force that you're hitting the ground, and we have a force plate, and we measure the force, and this is the impact peak here, and then this is the, so that's when the heel hits the ground here, then this peak is when the whole foot comes over the body, is that we see in barefoot the impact peak occurs sooner and the line is more vertical, so that means the rate of loading is increased. So that means that it's a firmer shock when they hit barefoot than when they load in the, the, uh, with the shoes on. Also, uh, studies show that barefoot running will increase the tibial vertical acceleration uh, in uh, one study. Again, now, you can go back to the literature and find studies where the barefoot runners hit softer. And, and this is the part of the difficulty of looking at this research, because in the research, it really depends on how the researchers did the study. And this is true of all scientific research, is that we have to be careful in reading these papers, whether this is something that is, um, is the uh, barefoot running uh, been done to the patients the way the patient wants, or the, uh, the subject wants to run it, are they on a treadmill? Are they on a hard surface? Have they been a barefoot runner? Are they a trained barefoot runner? Or someone who's a shod runner who's just starting to barefoot mm -hmm. run at the beginning? See, so this is what makes it difficult in, in, in analyzing any of this research is that we have a difficulty. The people on one side, the barefoot side, will say, well, look, that was done wrong. And the people on the shod side will say, well, this is, you know, that's okay. You know, so, I mean, really, there's not enough research under our belts quite yet to make definite conclusions. I'm just trying to present some of the opposite uh, anti-barefoot stuff because I feel like we're getting a lot of, there's been so much stuff written that barefoot's great and everyone should be doing it that I want to present the research and show the studies that didn't uh, show that. Now one thing that's on the pro-barefoot side that I've learned and I I'm actually is real interesting is that what we're seeing is that the studies is that when people run barefoot they actually seem to have less force <coughs> or less moment arm, rather it's lever arm for the force from the ground.